So today we're going to be talking about Parkinson's disease and the drug therapy that can be used to uh, combat the symptoms associated with it. So there's no cure, but we can give people medication and certain types of surgery as well and electro uh, stimulation, which can alleviate some of the symptoms. So the basic pathology of Parkinson's disease is the loss of dopamine in the striatum. So this is the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Um, and this is due to a degeneration of um, the nigro striatal pathway um, and the dopaminergic inputs uh, to the pathway, um, to the striatum from the sub substantia nigra. Uh, so when you lose uh, the neurons in substantia nigra, uh, you, you get a a deficit in dopamine um, into the striatum. So the substantia nigra is important um, in it for a number of functions. These include eye movement due to its close association with cranial nerve 3, motor planning, learning, uh, reward seeking as well as addiction. Uh, so many of these effects are mediated through the striatum which will collect or integrate the signals from the cortex um, which, where the initiation of the voluntary movement occurs and the striatum will prepare um, the motor system for the next movement in a given sequence of movements. So we have four main strategies to increase the amount of dopamine in the brain. We can increase the synaptic concentration of dopamine we can directly activate D2 receptors via dopamine agonists. We can prevent the metabolism or degradation of dopamine within the synapse or, and also within the periphery. And lastly, we can alter the efficacy of interacting neurotransmitters. So we'll start off with number one, increasing the synaptic concentration of dopamine. So levodopa is a precursor of dopamine. And the reason why we can't use pure dopamine is the fact that it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we'd only see uh, peripheral effects, which would be pointless. Um, so levodopa um, is, uh, as I said, a dopamine precursor. But the issue is that it, it gets broken down in the peripherally quite readily. And so um, it would basically have a really short, heart life, short half life of around two hours. And this is because a substance known as uh, dopa decarboxylase breaks it down in the periphery. And so in order to combat this issue, we give uh, levodopa in association with dopa decarboxylase inhibitors. Um, and there's a couple of those on the market and they're known as uh, carbidopa and benzerazide. Um, so the combination of carbidopa and levodopa is known as levocarb. Uh, levodopa equals levocarb. So there are a couple of adverse effects associated with uh, levocarb. And this mainly involves dyskinesia, which is just abnormal involuntary mu movements. Um, and this is just due to a heightened amount of dopamine. You get buccal or lingual grimacing, um, as well as abnormal, movement, abnormal movements in the head and trunk. And um, this is these symptoms worsen if the dosage is not appropriate or that it's um, not reduced when these symptoms uh, take place. Um, but the, it's, it's difficult to manage because there are gross fluctuations in the plasma and in the brain, as well as you get changes to receptor sen sen sensitization, as well as changes in postsynaptic dopamine. So as the name suggests, D2 agonists are going to bind directly to the D2 receptor and thereby activating the postsynaptic cell. So this kind of setup offers um, greater reliability in the dose-by-dose -dose effects because you're not going to have 
the issue with metabolism um, and variations in plasma or um, brain uh, concentrations. And so uh, you're less likely to get uh, dyskinesias and it also has um, a longer half-life than you will see um, for levodopa. Um, and the drugs uh, that we're concerned about are ampomorphine, bromocryptine, and pergolide. So these basically all do the same thing, and they've all got very similar adverse effects. So ones that are commonly seen um, are the, the classical GI um, effects as well as hypotension, but these aren't necessarily due to um, the, the direct GI upset, but it's more due to the fact that dopamine um, activates the C2Z um, C, CTZ, which is the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And then you also get a few psychological effects, which are, are very common, and they're things that you know you wouldn't really wish on anyone. Um, and this is due to the interaction of dopamine um, in the mesocortical or the mesolimbic pathway, uh, which is seen in um, psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. And so you get those positive symptoms associated with those disorders, such as delusions, mania, anxiety. So um, this is just because when you're increasing... Um, the response of dopamine in these areas, you get spilling over, so to speak, to other areas of the brain, such as the mesocortical pathway. So another way to increase the amount of dopamine in the synapse is to prevent its metabolism. And so we'll have the release of dopamine uh, from the little vesicles from here into the synapse. And that may not be very much in the case of um, Parkinson's disease but in order to um, well what happens is this dopamine is then reuptaken into the presynaptic terminal when it's not completely used um, and it's it's metabolized by an enzyme known as monoamine oxidase uh, so this enzyme is going to break it down and it will stop um, the recycling of dopamine and then the reuse into the, ner the nerve terminal. And so if we can block monoamine oxidase, we're going to have an increase in um, availability of dopamine. I should have mentioned previously that this is exclusively MAL B. Okay, so um, MAL A is um, involved in another pathology that we'll cover, which is depression, and so MAL-A inhibitors um, can be used in that setting. So our main drug that we're worried about is called selegiline. I don't know how to pronounce it, but selegiline maybe? I'm not sure. Um, which is, a uh, trade name is Deprinol, um, and it's a selective MAL-B inhibitor, so we're only going to be um, interfering with the Parkinsonian-like symptoms. Um, and you do get minor adverse effects, but they can basically be given without restriction. Um, so people do complain of a little bit of insomnia as well as headache. Um, so that could be associated with their slight interaction with the MAL-A. So something that I'm going to briefly touch on um, is COMPT. So COMT is um, another pathway that is sometimes heightened when you um, remove the other pathways responsible for dopamine breakdown. So um, the inhibition of dopamine decarboxylase, as we discussed earlier, which we give alongside levodopa, um, we give us we give 
dopamine decarboxylase inhibitors alongside levodopa. When you inhibit um, this certain pathway that's responsible for the breakdown of um, dopamine in the periphery, you get an upregulation of other pathways, and one in particular is COMP. So we can use certain drugs, namely tolcapone and entacapone, um, alone or in combination with uh, levodopa decarboxylase defi- inhibitor uh, to improve these dose fluctuations that we tend to see. And it'll most notably prolong the levodopa half-life. Uh, the good thing about it is you get minor adverse effects and it's, it's really an addition to that levodopa therapy that we see, um, they're very commonly used to just improve its efficacy. So dopaminergic neurons usually exert a tonic inhibitory influence on cholinergic neurons within the striatum. So um, Parkinson's disease will remove this inhibitory influence and it'll intensify the activity of the cholinergic system. So you can appreciate that you would get all the sludge um, symptoms, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI upset and emesis. So um, we'd get a, a hyperactivity of the cholinergic system. So if we use muscarinic antagonists, we're going to be able to um, inhibit this system. And so this will uh, see a, a mild relief in the early stages of Parkinson's disease. Um, And so two drugs that are commonly used are benzotropine and amantadine. Um, And so uh, these have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and so therefore they're centrally active. So just a quick note about polypharmacy and the recommendations when you're prescribing for Parkinson's disease. So um, progressively, like many drugs, uh, these agents become less and less effective um, because it is a degenerative disease. And so um, we, we do recommend uh, polypharmacy because you're going to have a greater um, response with more drugs. Um, so uh, levodopa, as we've mentioned earlier, is, it's, a good, it's a good drug, but it's, it's spared for the treatment of more severe Parkinson's disease because it is efficacious and so we we want to save it for when the patient really needs it. Um, You have the dopamine agonists, uh, ampomorphine and bromocryptine that we we can use in combination with levodopa when levodopa isn't effective enough Um, and also uh, celagline is always used um, when uh, to reduce the associated wearing off um, with levodopa therapy.